Greetings and welcome to the Lumens Technologies First Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone at any time during the presentation. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press star 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Mark Stoutenberg from Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, France. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Lumen Technologies first quarter 2021 earnings call. Joining me today on the call are Jeff Story, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Neil Dev, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I need to call your attention to our safe harbor statement on slide two of our 1Q 2021 presentation, which notes that this conference call may include forward-looking statements subject to certain risks and uncertainties. All forward-looking statements should be considered in conjunction with the cautionary statements on slide two and the risk factors in our SEC filings. We will be referring to certain non-GAAP financial measures reconciled to the most comparable GAAP measures that can be found in our earnings press release. In addition, certain metrics discussed today exclude costs for special items as detailed in our earnings materials, all of which can be found on the Investor Relations section of the Lumen website. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jeff. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's call. I'm going to take a few minutes at the outset to share my perspective on the quarter and some of the key value drivers I see, not only in our business, but also with respect to our capital allocation and inorganic strategies. After that, I'll ask Neil to walk you through the details of the quarter and key drivers for the remainder of 2021. Then we'll open it up for your questions. Before diving into our results for the quarter, I want to discuss a few points coming out of our Investor Day in April. I hope those of you who were able to join us gained a better understanding of the markets, products, and services we believe will drive our future growth, as well as a sense of our conviction that we have the right assets, people, investment plans, and execution strategies to grow both revenue and shareholder value over time. The path we reviewed during our analyst day is pretty straightforward. We are combining one of the world's best fiber infrastructures, our deep global interconnections to eyeball networks, and our increasingly robust Lumen platform to build the infrastructure necessary to support a full range of fourth industrial revolution applications and use cases, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, IoT, and unified communications. As of today, more than 85% of U.S. enterprises are within five milliseconds latency of our edge cloud facilities. We are well on our way to reach our end of the year goal of 95% of U.S. enterprises. Our fiber-enabled edge infrastructure, together with our embedded security capabilities and adaptive networking services, allows Lumen to deliver a differentiated solution set for expanding market opportunities. We are excited about the growing market for these services and our ability to meet those demands. For those who were unable to join our investor day, I invite you to go to our website to review the information we shared. I'm personally bullish on our approach. It leverages our greatest, most unique asset, one of the world's largest and most powerful fiber-based networks to drive growth in both core fiber-based network services as well as adjacent services such as security and edge computing that are greatly enhanced by our fiber network. The demand for these services is growing and we're investing into and are well positioned to grow with that market. I believe it is a compelling thesis. At the same time, I understand our business needs to deliver top line revenue improvement today. While we delivered strong EBITDA and free cash flow in the first quarter, the revenue results don't yet meet our expectations. 
Neil will go into the details, but I want you to hear directly from me that we are not satisfied and are focused on growth. As we've mentioned on previous calls, COVID-related lengthening in sales cycles across both public and business sectors continues to create near-term revenue uncertainty. For example, public sector sales at the end of 4Q20 and the first couple of months of 1Q21 were light. We are market share takers in the public sector and government slowdowns have created fewer opportunities to win new awards. This especially affects the one-time revenue we often see at the beginning of new contracts, which typically includes professional services, equipment sales, and installation charges. Similarly, the state, local, and education customers have naturally focused all of their resources on COVID response. We believe the pause in these sectors will prove to be simply one of timing. While we all began to learn about COVID in the first quarter of 2020, the nature of our business and sales cycles makes the effect of COVID more of a 2021 event for us. As we see the U.S. beginning to come out of the pandemic, we expect to see improvement in the second half of the year. I offer you these details to provide color on the quarter, not to rationalize results. We are very focused on revenue and expect to accelerate growth where we invest. But thus far, our growth is not at the pace required to overcome the declines in voice and legacy data services. We have the assets, the products, the people and processes in place to drive higher levels of revenue growth, and now it comes down to execution. Beyond revenue, we are continuing to do a lot of great work to improve the fundamentals of our business and to drive long-term growth. We have continued to expand the reach, the power and reliability of our world-class fiber infrastructure. Our fiber network is at the core of who we are and is the engine that will drive both our and our customers' success. It is among the best in the world, and we make it better every day. Our Lumen platform allows enterprise customers to seamlessly deploy the connectivity, the infrastructure, and the applications they need to transform their businesses to the new realities of the fourth IR. We have enabled key products and partnerships that drive full-service solutions for our customers and integrate the network within their cloud applications. We have begun to deploy the automation and customer experience that will define our future. Across our business, these changes have driven both higher levels of customer satisfaction and enabled us to maintain strong EBITDA margins. These initiatives are ongoing and I believe demonstrate we're doing the things required to drive long-term growth in revenue, EBITDA, free cash flow, and shareholder value. I'm proud of this work and believe it will define our future success. As I said earlier, though, we have a strong sense of urgency to accelerate top-line growth. We are seeing positive results in our customer interactions and early success with our edge cloud efforts. As an example, our SAP alliance has led to the onboarding of major VAR customers on the Lumen platform. VARs like our customer, Christine, Rather than hear my views, though, I thought I'd just share an exact quote from the customer. Through the entire process, we've been impressed with the Lumen offering. Their insight into our business demands and the quality of their team resulted in a packaged offering that targets the key challenges facing value-added resellers in our market space. Obviously, I like to hear customer quotes like this, but I also want to point out that this is the exact intent of our entire Lumen platform. We understand the focus on near-term revenue, but believe too singular a focus on that topic overshadows the many other positives in our business. I'm not going to belabor this point. We shared with you our view of the sum of the parts of our business last year. That information is still on our website, and I would encourage you to give it another look. I think that the simple and straightforward analysis speaks for itself and the market value for assets such as ours continues to support that basic view. A market cap less than five times the midpoint of our free cash flow guidance and our current EBITDA multiple does not reflect our extensive fiber infrastructure or the growth potential we highlighted in our analyst day. Moreover, we have a strong balance sheet enabled by our deleveraging initiatives. Given our conviction around our growth initiatives, 
and our equity valuation, I'd like to share a few thoughts on capital allocation. Of course, our first capital allocation priority is to make the investments required to drive healthy growth and returns within our core business. These investments are not linear from one quarter to another, and we expect 2021 capital investment will accelerate from first quarter levels. I'm confident we are investing in an appropriate level to support our growth, expand our fiber network, and enable the systems and programs that will continue to drive higher levels of sales, customer satisfaction, and operating efficiency. We are committed to investing in growth. Beyond investing in the business, we're also very focused on our dividend as a key element of our capital allocation strategy. We still get the occasional question or comment about the sustainability of or our commitment to our dividend. Frankly, this puzzles me. As I'm sure you can appreciate, it's difficult for any company to make completely unqualified statements about their capital allocation policy, including dividends, and we're no different. That said, I think we've been clear that we look at our current dividend level as both an appropriate capital allocation approach and an important proof point about our confidence in the future of our business. And with the current payout ratio in the 30s as a percentage of free cash flow, I think the question about sustainability answers itself. We believe the dividend is an important element in our delivery of value to shareholders and that the current level of dividend is supported by sustainable payout ratios. You know, too, we've been focused on strengthening our balance sheet and reducing our interest expense. And we've done a lot of good work in this space. Since announcing the deleveraging plan, we've reduced $4 billion in debt, refinanced more than $20 billion, improved our maturity profile, and reduced cash interest expense by almost $600 million per year. This obviously enhances the financial position of the company and is very beneficial to our free cash flow profile. We did what we said we were going to do here, and there's no question in my mind that it was the right thing to do to sustain long-term value. In terms of interest cost savings, coverage ratios, and credit profile, we've largely achieved the outcomes we targeted with our deleveraging plan. We are maintaining our debt to EBITDA target range and expect to get there over time with a combination of EBITDA growth and debt pay down. Our cash flow profile and balance sheet improvements give us the flexibility to reassess our capital allocation after investing in the business and supporting the dividend. Given our conviction around our sum of the parts analysis, fiber asset valuation, and our business plan, we believe our shares trade at a significant discount to their true value. As we continue to progress toward our leverage targets, this naturally leads to discussions with the board about share buybacks. We've made no decisions and are not making any specific announcements, but it is certainly part of our discussion. Finally, I'd like to talk about our approach to inorganic opportunities to grow or unlock value. You've heard me say before that we are constantly evaluating alternatives to enhance shareholder value and are open-minded, including divestitures. I know you hear that phrase from virtually every CEO and that it can just sound like CEO talk, and I understand that point of view, but I want to be clear that we are actively looking at selling non-core assets to unlock value in our business, further accelerate deleveraging, and implement potential buyback programs. That said, we have been and will remain disciplined. We have confidence in our future and don't feel compelled to undertake any specific transaction. If we find transactions that are positive to shareholders, we won't hesitate to move forward. Let me summarize before I pass it over to Neil. We understand we must improve our revenue trajectory. We are focused and unflinching in our assessment of what we must do to drive that change. It does not happen overnight in a business such as ours, but we know it must improve. At the same time, I have strong personal conviction that we are doing the things required to position Lumen for the future. We are expanding the reach and capacity of our already powerful fiber network. We are improving our product set transforming our customer experience, and reducing our cost of delivery. And again, I will highlight that we have a strong cash flow profile and an improved balance sheet that allows us to invest in the future of our business. While we reposition ourselves for long-term growth via the Lumen platform for enterprises and quantum fiber for mass markets, 
We will also continue to maintain the discipline required for us to deliver value to our equity holders, not only through growth, but also through inorganic options, the return of capital through dividends, the ongoing reduction of leverage, and should we decide it is a better way to allocate capital, the possibility of share buybacks. With that, I'll turn the call over to Neil to review some of the details from the quarter. Neil? Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me begin with our financial summary on slide four. For the first quarter of 2021, we delivered solid adjusted EBITDA and expanded adjusted EBITDA margin on a sequential and a year-over-year -year basis. We also generated solid free cash flow. Based on our progress in the first quarter, we remain confident in our financial performance and are reiterating our outlook for the full year 2021. Turning to revenue on slide five, total revenue in the first quarter declined 3.8% to 5.029 billion. Adjusting for the sale of a significant portion of our correctional facility business in the third quarter of 2020, our revenue would have declined 3.6%. Business revenue in the first quarter declined 3.8% to 3.595 billion or 3.5% adjusting for the business sell that I just mentioned. Our overall business segment revenue performance was impacted by lengthening sales cycles in the current environment that we mentioned during the last few earnings calls in our recent analyst day. Within our business segment, IGAM revenue decreased 2.7% compared to roughly flat in the year ago quarter. In addition to lengthening sales cycles, our revenue performance this quarter was impacted by some CDN re-rates and a large customer disconnect. Large enterprise declined 3% compared to a growth of 2.3% in the year ago quarter. As you have mentioned, revenue performance was impacted by lower sales and completion of several projects in public sector. Within compute and application services, we had a few COVID-related projects winding down. Sequential decline in fiber infrastructure services category was a result of non-recurring revenue ramping down from completion of several network deployments without the corresponding benefit of similar revenues ramping up from new sales. Mid-market enterprise declined 5.9% compared to 6.5% in the year of the quarter. The correctional facility business sale I mentioned impacted mid-markets but was largely offset by a strong quarter for non-recurring revenues for equipment and professional services. Our wholesale channel declined 4.1% on a year-over-year -year basis compared to 6.6% in the year ago quarter. This quarter benefited from non-recurring revenue from a few carrier settlements. Moving to slide six, compute and application services for enterprise channels declined 2.3% year over year. As I mentioned, performance was impacted by CDN re-rates and the large customer disconnect in our IDM channel, along with completion of COVID-related projects in the public sector. As highlighted in our analyst day, this category includes Cloud Edge and a number of our newer capabilities, and we expect it'll take some time to get market traction. IP and data services for enterprise channels declined 2.2% year over year. Performance was impacted by lower sales for hybrid networks as enterprises deal with uncertainty related to future of work. While churn remains relatively stable for traditional VPN networks, we continue to see delayed decision making for new SD-WAN and hybrid network sales. Fiber infrastructure services for enterprise channels grew 1.5% year over year. As I mentioned in my channel remarks, sequential performance was impacted by completion of several large projects in our public sector vertical within large enterprise. We continue to manage voice and other services in the wholesale channel for cash. Turning to mass markets on slide seven, First quarter 2021 revenue declined 3.8%. Within mass markets, consumer broadband revenue grew 1.2% and SBG broadband revenue was flat. We are very focused on the continued rollout of our quantum fiber product. For the quarter, 
we saw sequential growth in fiber customers by approximately 40,000. We exited the quarter with about 2.5 million homes enabled with fiber and 715,000 broadband customers on fiber. From a mixed perspective, about 15% of our mass market's broadband customers are now on fiber. As we have mentioned before, we expect that future performance will be largely driven by our continued success-based investments in our fiber to the home and small business and execution around driving up penetration of our competitive assets. Turning to adjusted EBITDA on slide A, for the first quarter of 2021, adjusted EBITDA was $2.165 billion, compared to $2.209 billion from the year above quarter. We continued to expand adjusted EBITDA margins during the quarter, which grew to 43.1% compared to 42.3% in the year above quarter. We continue to invest in all the product, channel, and customer experience initiatives we highlighted at our analyst day, but we're able to more than offset those investments with our continued focus on transformation savings. Capital expenditures for the first quarter of 2021 were 716 million. As we have mentioned, a significant portion of our CapEx is success-based. The lower sales from delayed customer decision-making also resulted in lower success-based capital spending during the quarter. We also continue to see benefits from our capital efficiency programs. In the first quarter of 2021, the company generated free cash flow of $850 million. During the first quarter, we continued to make progress on our deleveraging initiative by reducing net debt by more than $460 million. In January of 2021, we also issued our first sustainability-linked bond resulting in interest cost savings and highlighted our strong ESG program. On a year-over-year -year basis, we have reduced net debt by $2.1 billion. As Jeff mentioned, we are pleased with the progress we have made towards strengthening our balance sheet and credit profile over the past couple of years. Turning to the business outlook on slide nine, we feel good about the progress to date, and we are reiterating all of our 2021 financial outlook measures. Specifically, we remain confident about our adjusted EBITDA target of 8.4 to 8.6 billion, and expect future cash flow of 2.8 to 3 billion for the full year 2021. In summary, we continue to deliver solid EBITDA and free cash flow. With a strong balance sheet, we are investing in the business with the objective of improving revenue trajectory and delivering long-term EBITDA and free cash flow per share growth. With that, we'll open it up for your questions. France, would you please explain the process? Thank you. If you would like to register a question, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw, please press the one and the three. Our first question is from the line of Becha Levy with UBS. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you. A couple questions. Um, maybe first on trends that you're seeing in terms of lengthening the sales cycle. Um, has that been getting worse as we are looking at the, over the last few months? Any change recently that gives you the confidence that we could see some improvement in the second half? And um, maybe a question um, to Neil. There were a, a few one-time items that you highlighted. Could we get some numbers around that? Maybe the non-recurring benefits in the wholesale segment or the contribution of the large customer disconnect in IGAM. Um, and maybe a final question um, on the non-core assets. Could you, the uh, potential non-core asset sales, could you talk about what you would consider to be non-core? Thank you. Thanks, Patia. Uh, let me talk about sales cycles first. I, I don't know that they're lengthening any more than, than we've talked about over the last a uh, couple of quarters and, and during our analyst day back in April. 
Um, we saw sales toward the end of the year lighter than we liked and, and sales at the beginning of the year lighter. But we had good sales in March. And so we're starting to, we've got a good, strong funnel. Uh, the market for our products and services are there. We're seeing better, better sales in March. I don't know if that's an overall change yet in the sales cycles, uh, but things are starting to close again. And then with respect to non-core assets, I'll, I'll jump to the middle question, let Neil answer that. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into specifics about, uh, about different parts of our business uh, and which ones that I'd call core and non-core. I think there's probably pretty good sense of, of what those are. Um, but if you look at where we invest, we're investing heavily in certain markets and certain capabilities and certain products, and those are the things that, that we think are core. So our fiber infrastructure, our um, edge computing, our platform that we're building, our customer experience, quantum fiber, all of those things we think are core to us and core to the, the products and services and that, that we sell, and so we'll continue to focus our our investments there. Neil? Um, on the on the question on some of the you know one time items um, you know in terms of IGAM I called out a couple of things uh, one is you know, we had some re rates for CDN we typically see that um, for some of our large customers just to get the rates to market and over time we'll see volume growth and we also had a large customer disconnect. It's a customer that we've had for seven plus years. We just couldn't get to the right um, commercial terms going forward. Combination of those two things um, roughly was $15 million impact uh, sequentially for, for IGAM. Uh, in terms of uh, large enterprise, um, it was primarily public sector. Um, there were some COVID related projects winding down, like I mentioned and also like Jeff referenced in his remarks and I mentioned as well, um, fiber infrastructure related projects uh, complete, completing and those two things in aggregate was roughly a $40 million impact sequentially. Thank Our you, next Pat, yeah. question is from the line of Eric Luco with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. I uh, appreciate you taking the question. Um, Jeff, I just wanted to follow up. Um, you know, I know you said that you would look at, you know, potential divestitures. Um, you did have a strategic review in consumer, uh, your consumer uh, footprint recently. Um, just wondering if maybe you could comment on that as maybe an area you would at least look at and related to that, you know, is that business sufficiently separated from a network perspective from kind of your core enterprise business that you potentially could consummate, you know, such a deal in the relatively near term um, if an opportunity did arise. And then my second question was on your quantum footprint. I used to see fiber penetration almost 30%. Maybe you could just talk about, you know, where you're winning share in that footprint. Is it coming from more new accounts or are there a lot of existing customers you're upgrading from legacy technologies? And then, you know, any reasonable target in your more mature fiber markets in terms of penetration? Thank you. Sure. And, and I'll try and uh, provide a little more color to, to Patia's question, but, but not too much. Um, if you look at core and non-core, you know, there is a, if you're looking at Denver and the, the network that we operate here in Denver, uh, there's a strong tie between some of our commercial business and some of our mass market business. If you look in other markets, that's not as strong. Uh, so what we will look at uh, with respect to, to the, the consumer copper network, that type of thing, would be looking at markets that we don't think are necessarily core to our fi quantum fiber strategy. Um, I, haven't, I don't want to be very specific about what those could be or might be, um, but I do want to emphasize that we're open to looking at, at divestitures, and we actively pursue them. Now, I'm not ready to announce any deals because we don't have one, um, but, but I do want to, to you know, reinforce that this isn't just CEO talk. It isn't just me saying, oh, yeah, we're open to whatever. And we sold the, our, the majority of our corrections business. Um, we've looked at other parts of the business, and we'll continue to do that um, and, and make sure that, that we're focused on the core of what's going to drive success for Lumen. Back to the fiber network, 
back to our platform capabilities, things like edge computing, dynamic connections. We recognize with the change coming for our customers in the fourth industrial revolution, those are the core assets that are going to drive our growth. And if it's not core to us, then we're open and, and uh, opportunistic about considering other alternatives. Neil, would you take the second half? Sure, Jeff. Um, Eric, in terms of your question on quantum fiber, you know, what we see is our micro-targeting approach is working. And um, from an aggregate level, I know we're 28% uh, penetration, and that's because, you know, as we are driving up our penetration, we're also, um, you know, adding more units. But if we look uh, at you know, certain neighborhoods, uh, certain markets uh, where we've been there for a while, uh, and we track uh, the penetration by aging of those deployments. In some markets, we're up in the 40, 50% zip code. Um, so we clearly think there's a fair amount of opportunity to continue to drive the penetration up. So we'll continue with our focus on adding uh, more fiber to the home and small business and driving up those penetration rates. Great, thank you. Our next question is from the line of Simon Flannery with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Right. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, Jeff, can you just talk about the buyback program and, and what the triggers would be? Uh, you talked about getting down to the leverage target. Do you need to get to the top end of the range to start the buyback program, the 325, or do you need to have a deal that gets you there? Um, you could always start a program now, even if you didn't necessarily use it. And then, Neil, you had a very impressive performance on the OPEX side, particularly sequentially. We saw a big drop in things like SG&A. I know there was some kind of changing in your allocations. Perhaps you could talk through any of the cost-saving items that were driving that. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. And as I said in the kind of prepared remarks, we've made no decisions about whether we'll institute a buyback program or not. It's a, it's a topic of discussion for our board, uh, the size, duration, parameters, all of those types of things, the triggers uh, that you referenced would be part of our discussion with our board. And so we will continue to have those, those discussions. So I don't have any specifics to share at this time. But our, our purpose in raising it uh, with you today is to signal that we believe our shares are undervalued and that considering buyback is a potentially attractive capital allocation uh, approach that, that we might take and, and want to be clear that it is something that we're considering. Okay. In, Simon, in, in terms of uh, the OPEX savings, uh, I would say a big part of uh, what we, you see in this quarter is uh, the run rate, the full quarter benefit of the run rate savings that we achieved in the fourth quarter. So if you recall, we, uh, you know, we, we achieved the uh, goals that we had for the transformation program, and so we see that benefit flowing through. And in addition to that, we had incremental savings um, that we achieved during the quarter as well. So that will be an ongoing uh, thing for us. We will be focused on uh, taking cost out of the business, and part of that we're investing back in all the things that you heard us talk about in the analyst day, but the overall transformation uh, program will continue for us. Great. Any any sense on the you know how, how it flows through the rest of the year? Are there other big sort of step functions in the the cost savings, or is it pretty linear from here? You know, like always, we'll be very milestone based about it. Um, and so, uh, some of the things that we're doing from a customer experience perspective, uh, you've heard a lot of our leaders talk about some of the automation initiatives. As we deploy those, we can take cost out of the organization. At the same time, it enables us to scale. Um, so, no, I think linear is probably a pretty good assumption. But overall, I would say net of um, investing in the business and driving those um, savings, we feel pretty good about our full year EBITDA guidance of 8.4 to 8.6. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Frank Lauten with the Raymond James. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I want to go back on the uh, potential divestitures. You know, you, you said you do consider it positive for shareholders. 
can you give us a little more color on on how you see that? I mean, I think some of the issue in the past has been, you know, buyers pay a price, but there's a lot of overhead and so forth that doesn't necessarily go away. Now you've got calf going away, um, you know, in some markets as well. Is there a, a materiality threshold of, uh, you know, for a sale price that, that makes it positive? I mean, I'm sure you could do a 10 or $20 million deal, but it may not be worth the time. Give us a, a thought on how you think about sort of the, the magnitude and, and, you know, that statement you made, Jeff, about, you know, consider it if it's positive for shareholders. Thanks. Yeah, um, I, won't give a, I won't give any comment on, on the magnitude, but I will tell you what positive looks like and, and what will trigger a decision is that we think it's in the interest of our shareholders to, to do that. Price certainly has something to do with that, our ability to, to separate the business uh, from from Lumen has something to do with that. Um, you know, our ability to 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 uh, capture and and make sure that we don't have dissynergies. I mean, there are all sorts of things that go into our our valuation uh, metrics that that go on with that. And and frankly, are we going to invest in it? If we're not going to invest in it, then um, then it's it's obviously not something core to us. Um, so we'll you know all of those types of things go into the decision matrix for for any deal that we do. Okay, and just a quick follow up. Do you have a an idea of maybe how many customers or an impact you think you might be coming from the EBBP plan that's uh, that, that's come, that's um, I guess going into place maybe starting next week? No, um, I don't have any kind of customer count. I will tell you that just like we did with the Keep America Connected. Uh, work with the FCC, that we're working with them, and we support the idea of helping our customers, our impacted customers, uh, during this difficult time, and and uh, and so we'll continue to work with the FCC. Might have some update later in future quarters about what that really means for us, but right now it's too early to say. All right, great. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of James Ratcliffe with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking your question. Uh, understanding the potential for divestiture is a very near view on the value of the business. So can you give us any color on why something substantive hasn't happened yet? Presumably you've had these conversations. Um, what have been the barriers? What have been the issues that have prevented, you know, uh, the divestiture or you know, sales of business sector to this point? Is it just price or are the other things going on? Thanks. Neil, yeah, why don't you take a shot at that? Sure. I think one of the key things that Jeff highlighted is uh, that we're being very disciplined about it because we want to make sure that is it's accretive to our shareholders, that it really creates value for our shareholders. With all the deleveraging that we've done and the strengthening of the balance sheet that we've done, we don't really have to do anything as such, but we think there are things that we could do that enhance our shareholder value. And so we're not in a hurry to get something done just for the sake of getting something done. It really is about doing something that creates more shareholder value, and that's why it's it's not a timeline driven initiative that we have to deliver or we have to do this. It really is about creating more shareholder value. And and we spent the last couple of years working on improving the fundamentals of our business. So things that even if we don't think they're core long term, we've we've improved our customer experience, we've reduced churn, we've we've stabilized things across, you know, the the operating costs, and we'll continue to do those things. If you look at the mass market business as an example on the consumer side, you know, we've, we grew something like 40,000 broadband, uh, high-speed broadband ads over the last quarter. And so we've been making investments to, to in different parts of our business um, to improve them up till this point. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Nick Del Deo with Moffitt Nathanson. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my questions. You know, first, you know, are, are you confident that you can accelerate revenue growth um, without having to backpedal on the profitability and return metrics that you've enforced for the business uh, you know, you know, since the deal closed? Like, has the market moved at all such that those metrics may need to be adjusted, or is that not something you're, you're saying? 
Nick, so, you know, one of the things that you don't see in our revenue line, but you hopefully see that in our profitability metrics, is our focus on, on net and our focus on uh, profitable revenues. So if you think about our business, every month you have churn and you're replacing that with newer services. And we focus on profitable revenues. And so as we've managed the business over the last couple of years, the revenues become more durable, more profitable. And if you think back to all the plans that we shared uh, at the analyst day, you know, fiber is foundational to all of that. Uh, and so being on net is a big part of our value proposition. And, and so we don't think we have to sacrifice profitability. In fact, we think our approach, uh, it's a better customer experience when we have the customer on that. Uh, and all of the higher layer services really leverages our infrastructure. And it is a better experience for the customer when there is automation, there is self-service, which drives a very different margin profile. Uh, you know, we're seeing that in the consumer space, and we're seeing that in the enterprise space. So, yeah, we don't need to. We don't think we need to make that trade-off. Now, in terms of investing um, to get some of these things going, in terms of uh, sales and marketing, um, some of the investments we're making with our, you know, partnerships, the ecosystems, uh, brand, etc., we're leaning in and making those investments. But over time, you know, the underlying product profitability, we don't think you don't have to, we don't have to make any trade-offs there. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. And then, you know, maybe one, one bigger picture question on revenue, you know, as, as I think back um, over the last several years, you've made some very, you know, as you know, some very substantial and positive changes to the business. Um, you know, I think Salesforce, customer service, new products, you know, those, those should have all helped uh, the revenue trajectory. If we set aside this quarter's results specifically, you know, and instead think about the multi-year growth trajectory you've had, you know, how has that compared to your ex expectations from, from years past, and, and what do you think the primary variances have been attributable to? So, you know, I would point you towards, uh, you know, some of the categories that we've laid out for our uh, reporting um, in terms of our expectation. Uh, now, we're not where we need to be, um, and uh, part of that is the environment that we're in and some of the delayed decision-making and sales cycle lengthening that we've highlighted. Uh, but Jeff mentioned, uh, you know, we had a good sales month in March. But going forward, I think you look at our reporting, that will manage for cash. Uh, on the enterprise channels, voice and other will continue to decline and we'll manage that for cash. But as we look at the areas that we're investing, uh, whether it's compute and application services, IP and data services, and our fiber infrastructure services, we expect to improve, uh, continue to improve our uh, revenue trajectory. Just to give you an example on like IP and data services, uh, right now we're seeing uh, you know churn, which is pretty much in line with our historical um, averages. But we're not selling a lot of large new networks. But we expect that to uh, you know change as we look at look forward. Uh, so those would be the categories that we'd expect to see improvement. Okay. Thank you. Our next uh, question, thank you. Our next question is from Brett Feldman with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. Um, and Jeff, you know, you, you noted during your remarks earlier that in the areas where, where you're making uh, significant investments, you are seeing good growth. Uh, and while we can see that there are, you know, pockets of growth across, you know, across portions of your business based on your reporting, you know, in aggregate, most of your revenue streams are still experiencing a degree of pressure. So it certainly would suggest that you know there there are areas where you could see a positive response to stepped up investment. So with that sort of context, I, I guess I'm intrigued that uh, buybacks are, are now sort of under evaluation. You know, it, as as the board looks at the the opportunity to potentially start repurchasing shares, what are the alternatives that you're going to be comparing it against? You know, I mean, what are the criteria to to make uh, additional direct investment in the business? whether it's a CapEx or the Salesforce or a product, or maybe even going out and pursuing acquisitions that might be complementary to the business versus the returns that you might get from, from 
in purchasing your shares. Thank you. Sure, and, and I think you answered your own question uh, a little bit, and that those are the alternatives. That can we invest in the business? Are there parts of the business we want to invest in uh, more heavily? Um, we have not yet started growing our edge computing uh, to the level that we want. Now, that's not unexpected because it's a brand new product set in a brand new market. Um, so, so you know, we're very focused on it and pleased with the, the reception in the market, but we think it can be great big. And so if we think it can, can be big, we would obviously uh, continue to invest in that if we get the market traction. Neil mentioned in his comments that we tend to be success-based uh, in our capital investments, and so we'll we'll make sure that we can continue to accelerate uh, growth by investing in those. And I'll put the point to mass markets for quantum fiber. You know, we we set out a couple of years ago. We were investing heavily in um, bonding and vectoring and and upgrading the copper plant. We stopped all of that. We invest in fiber. We are focused on fiber. For that business, so opportunities to increase there are also things that it would be uh, on the table. Um, investing in our sales force, all of the things that you mentioned uh, to drive revenue, because we are very focused on driving revenue, improving the revenue trajectory, and and driving that performance going forward. Yeah, the one thing I would add, Brett, is that if you look at the midpoint of our free cash flow, we're at $2.9 billion, our dividend of $1.1 billion, that leaves us $1.8 billion of discretionary uh, free cash flow, right? So there is a question of, uh, obviously, allocation and timing and sequencing. And so those are all going to be parts of the discussions that we continue to have with the board. Our next question is from the line of Michael Rollins with City. Please go ahead. Thanks, and good afternoon. Uh, a couple follow-ups and then, and then just a, a larger question. Um, so first, you mentioned some of the headwinds. You quantified some of the headwinds in an earlier question in IGAM and I think relating to um, the public sector. I was just curious if you could share the size of the revenue benefits you also disclosed on the uh, settlement payments that you referenced in the initial commentary. Um, second, just curious if there's any currency impact sequentially or year over year that we should be mindful of. And then just a larger question. Um, you mentioned in a market like Denver, you see uh, a synergy between the commercial and the mass market side. And I'm curious if you take the top 10 Denvers, you know, your top 10 markets where you see that synergy between commercial and mass market. You know, what does that look like in terms of the number of homes or population that you're serving and how upgraded those networks are from the context of fiber and uh, the quantum product? Thanks. Uh so I'll start with the easy one. Um, currency is was not a factor either sequentially or year over year. Uh, in terms of wholesale, you'll notice uh, you know the business was roughly flat sequentially, and like I mentioned, there was a benefit uh, from some carrier settlements, which is roughly about 15 million. And in mid markets, uh, we had a couple. Of, you have to keep in mind a couple of things going on. One is as you look at mid-market year over year, we did have the sale of the correctional facility business or a significant portion of that in third quarter of last year. And, uh, you know, if you look back uh, to first quarter of last year, that was roughly $15 million or so. And that was offset during the quarter with we did have some uh, good wins in the mid-market segment, and there were some one-time revenues related to that, which included uh, equipment and pro services. So if you look at the percentage change year over year, you don't really have to normalize for that if you're normalizing for non-recurring revenues. Uh, in terms of your question on top 10 markets, I can take a shot at that. Or, Jeff, do you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll try, and then you can, you can fill in the blanks. Um, I, we don't, I don't have any numbers to quantify the, the questions you have about what our top 10 markets, how many homes there are, how many fiber homes, any of that. But let me tell you about the strategy in those top um, markets. 
and that is when we build fiber down a street to go to a residential home, we also pass small business customers. We pass mid-market customers. We pass enterprise buildings. We pass wholesale locations and, and uh, government locations. And so, so we know that as we build infrastructure in those top markets, there's a lot of synergy that comes from the network that we build and the people that we use to operate it and the way that we deploy it. And that's not going to be true, and I'm always hesitant uh, to pick markets by name. I, mean, I pick Denver because that's where I'm sitting today. Um, but, but um, you know, if you look at some rural, small town, we don't have those same opportunities. And so they're not going to be as attractive to invest in. In addition, we follow a, when it comes to the consumer business, a, a very um, diligent uh, micro-targeting strategy where we look at the cost to build, we look at the densities, the average penetration rate, what we think we can accomplish in the market, the needs for the services, and we use those types of, of levers to, or triggers to identify where we want to build and where we don't want to build. Those typically are, are, are pretty good in our dense urban clusters uh, like a Denver. Neil, I don't know if you want to add. Uh, I don't really have anything to add. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. We're ready for the next question. Our next question is from the line of Phil Cusick with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thank you. Um, first, we've talked about um, activity and sales ramping in the second half. Do you, do you think that that means that revenue can ramp in the second half as well, or do the, the sort of you know, typical sales cycles mean that we're really looking at an improvement in 2022? And then second, Jeff, I, I apologize for coming back to this, this selling of non-core assets, but it seems like it's something we've been through before. Is, is this a new effort or a continuation of the strategic review that you went through a couple of years ago? And, and since then, has there been any change in your view of what assets you would be willing to sell or what appropriate structures might be? Thank you. So let me take the second one first. Um, it's not a new initiative. I've been saying for the last couple of years that we're working on um, looking at how we maximize shareholder value uh, for with the assets that we have. Do, does our opinion change over time? Potentially, depending on, on you know, what the market price is for those assets and and how well we're, they're, we're performing with them. So, so yeah, our, the calculations can change over time, but this isn't something new. The thing that I'm trying to address here is oh, I get comments from time to time that say, um, yeah, everybody says that. I'm sure everybody does say that. I just want you to know that we are serious about it and that we are looking uh, and continue to look at non-core assets and that, that uh, we'll continue to focus on how do we look at all of our assets and generate the best shareholder return with all those assets. Neil, do you want to take the first part? Phil, so on, on our commentary on the second half, uh, you know, I would say we're fairly optimistic, but there is also a fair amount of execution uh, in front of us. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, uh, we had good sales month, month in March. Uh, if you think about typical timelines for us in terms of sales to installs and turning into actual revenue, we, we need very good sales in the second quarter. Um, so we need to execute on sales in the second quarter. Uh, we need to execute on driving up usage on a lot of our usage-based uh, products and services. Uh, we are leaning into a lot of new initiatives that you heard us talk about. Um, those are emerging opportunities, and we need to see market traction on those initiatives. Uh, we have also, you've seen a number of uh, announcements from us in terms of our partner ecosystem systems. We're very optimistic about those uh, partnerships. Uh, we're working well with the partners there. We're going to market together, uh, and we'll need to see good traction on those uh, partnership ecosystems. Um, so, yeah, it's all about execution, and if we do execute, then we expect to see uh, not only just sales order ramp, but also revenue improvement. Thanks, guys. Jeff, if I can follow up, there's a ton of interest in, in fiber to the home, and I'm, I apologize, I keep coming back to this theme, but, but would you consider taking direct investment in 
in an acceleration in, the, in that business. If we thought that um, it was in our shareholders' interest, absolutely. Okay. Thanks again, yes. Thanks, so. France, we've got time for one last question. Thank you. Our last question then will be from the line of David Barden with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for, for squeezing me in. Um, I guess, Jeff, I wanted to ask you about kind of the competitive landscape, um, you know, starting with Verizon's kind of renewed interest in the business segment as a platform for selling their 5G network and obviously AT&T, you know, being the market leader in that. Um, you know, you recently announced a, a partnership with T-Mobile. Has the, is the landscape changing in a way that, that kind of uh, necessitates uh, a mobile product at this stage, or is that more of a, uh, kind of a prophylactic measure uh, just in case? And then um, the second question, Neil, could you – remind us in the context of this stock buyback conversation what the leverage target is when you want to achieve it and have you floated this by the rating agencies and what have they said thanks guys with respect to t-mobile and and uh 5g um we're really excited about the t-mobile relationship that we have we think that there's a great opportunity to marry their 5G network with our fiber network and, and take the, deliver the advantages of both to our mutual customers. And so we're super excited about it, especially as it, as it relates to edge computing, and we'll continue to invest in that. I don't, um, I don't have uh, specific use cases, but things like automated manufacturing, robotics, all of those types of things We'll really be able to leverage, uh, I think we'll be able to leverage the 5G network of T-Mobile with the fiber network of, of Lumen. Now, I always believe that wireless means exactly what the word says, um, just a little less wire, and that communications wants to get to the fiber optic very quickly, and that's where the, the strength of the Lumen network is, uh, is in the fiber backbone that we have, the fiber connectivity, the deep peering interconnections, all of those types of, of capabilities, and I think they're very competitively placed in the market. Yeah. David, in terms of your question on um, leverage target, uh, like Jeff mentioned, we haven't changed the target. The target is uh, 2.75 to 3.25. But the key point is, uh, from a timeline standpoint, we don't see um, a real urgency to get there uh, right away. We'll get there over time because that is just one data point. You have to look at uh, holistically uh, where we stand and some of the outcomes that we've achieved in terms of our interest cost savings, um, the coverage ratios that we have, our access to markets, our maturity profile, et cetera. So overall, um, we are very comfortable with getting there over uh, over time. In terms of the rating agencies, we're in constant conversations uh, with them. We provide them regular updates um, uh, in terms of our business. Um, and like Jeff mentioned, we don't have anything specific yet to share with them. And when we do, we'll obviously have that discussion. Okay. All right. Well, thank Wonderful. you all for, for joining us today. I. I appreciate everybody taking the time. I guess I, I'll summarize with a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, we're focused on revenue, profitable revenue. We never talk about anything but uh, profitable revenue uh, and free cash flow. So we continue to stay focused as a company on the free cash flow that we generate, but, but driving that through profitable revenue growth. Uh, we're excited about the capabilities that we talked to you about a few weeks ago at the analyst day. We think we're bringing the products and services and the capabilities over the Lumen platform that the market needs and that the fourth industrial revolution demands. And so we're really excited about our partnerships, uh, like the one that, that you asked about with T-Mobile, because we think that helps us and augments our capabilities to deliver that, and we're starting to see uh, success with some of those partnerships. We continue to invest in growth. We aren't um, skimping on capital. 
We are focused on, on growing our business where we think the market will go. We're focused on in, in continuing to augment what we believe is one of the world's most powerful fiber networks, and we'll continue to do that both on the mass market side and on the enterprise side. Now, we also think that our shares are undervalued, um, and that brings up the questions for our board about what's the best capital allocation approach, and so we wanted to, to mention that to you, that we are having those discussions uh, with the board. And then lastly, you know, we are, we've got a lot of questions on this, um, but we are serious about looking at the best way to, to maximize all of our assets uh, for our shareholders. Some of those that are core, invest heavily in them. Those that are non-core, look if there are opportunities to, um, to divest them or, or take cash out of them. You know, we will look at what we think is the best strategy for each of those types of assets for maximizing value. With that, I'll, I'll wrap the call. Thank you for, for your attendance today. Thank you for your interest in Lumen. We appreciate it. Thank you. We would like to thank everyone for your participation and for using the Lumen conferencing service today. This does conclude the conference call. We ask that you please disconnect your lines. Have a great day, everyone.